Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would answer some patron emails. This first email is from patron anonymous, anonymous patron. They write, I have recently been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which seems to fit with my life experience. I have been in my own therapy for several years. I've also had this dream of being a therapist for a long time, and I am contemplating going back to school to become a therapist. What are your thoughts on someone with a personality disorder becoming a therapist? What are the pros and cons? I know that it will be important for me to continue doing my own work in therapy, and for what it's worth, I am working successfully in another human service position currently. End of email. Yeah, I get this question occasionally, and... There are, uh, there's no evidence that shows that therapists with personality disorders uh, cannot be effective. There are so many other factors that play into how effective you are as a therapist. Having a borderline personality disorder uh, is, can, it can complicate things for sure, but really there are so many different things that can complicate your ability to empathize, your ability to conceptualize, your ability to graduate, your ability to um, you know, have compassion and understand your clients and even follow your supervision, your supervisor's uh, directives. I have uh, been in academia. I've been training therapists for over 20 years. And I have personally kicked people out of my program and uh, removed them from the profession because of their issues. And sometimes it's due to what I might characterize as um, the effect of a personality disorder. But uh, on the other hand, I would say that every student I've worked with in all likelihood has been on some personality disorder spectrum. So it is. And, and really, uh, I should extend that to everybody. <laughs> Everyone I know is on some personality disorder spectrum, meaning that we all have issues related to our difficulties early in life. It's just a matter of degree. We all need defense mechanisms to cope with those experiences. And in greater uh, degrees, you would call those defense mechanisms a personality disorder. So... It's uh, not a barrier to have borderline. I know plenty of therapists who have, who, you know, have told me that they have borderline personality disorder and borderline. Uh, so the pros and cons, you're asking, you know, what are the pros and cons? Well, the pro to having borderline is that you'll understand other people with borderline personality, which is, you know, wonderful because a lot of people with borderline will go to therapy and it's actually kind of hard to understand the disorder. And so you'll be, you know, eons ahead of uh, your, your classmates in that way, which is a big deal. And the other pro is that when, you know, the, the relational traumas that a, a person with borderline goes through is, uh, is it gears them towards developing a defense mechanism of, of, of really paying attention to other people. And so the borderline person early in life learns that in order to cope with abandonment or chaos or abuse is to really pay attention to their, to their loved one's emotional state, to uh, distance and closeness and to monitor that, to really focus on other people. And so that will make you a very good judge of what other people are going through. And it'll also make you, you know, in all likelihood, quite perceptive of other people's internal states, you know, without them talking about it. The con is that when you suffer from borderline personality disorder, you're very sensitive to betrayal and distance and criticism. And there are a lot of uh, opportunities for that to be triggered throughout your career. When you are in graduate school and a teacher decides to give you an F, well, that's going to hurt. And it's going to really hurt if you have a lot of traumas regarding people treating you unfairly. You will uh, start working with clients and some clients won't like you for whatever reason. That's not easy for any trainee, but could be a bigger deal to someone with borderline personality. Maybe not, you know, it, 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 not everyone with borderline is the same 
And the fact that you can talk about the fact that you have it and that you're getting treated for it means that you're well on your way to recovery. So, um, uh, or you're at least somewhat on your way to recovery. So, uh, so there's that. Another issue that I've seen come up with borderline trainees of mine is the supervisor supervisee relationship. When you are, uh, a, you know, you're a trainee, you're a supervisee, you're very vulnerable to your supervisors. Your supervisors can make or break your career and have total um, uh, evaluative control over uh, your academic life and what and they can gatekeep you in the same way that I said earlier is that I have gatekept meaning that I have prevented some people from entering the field because to be clear as to I don't I don't remove them from the field because they have a personality disorder. That is not, maybe I was implying that earlier. I'll, I'll retract that um, implication. The reason why I will gatekeep people, as we call it, is because they have impaired judgment, impaired empathy, impaired ability to develop properly as a, as a trainee. Uh, one thing that will, uh, uh, that is a pattern of evidence that leads to someone being removed from the program is from my program is if you lie uh, and you try to deceive people or you're abusive to your clients or you don't take orders from supervisees uh, well or you do what you feel like you should do instead of following your supervisees directions and usually these are things like just lying about your hours, um, uh, you know, being a, a ha, causing a lot of conflict at your internship site, and then being fired and starting a new internship ship site and starting a whole new set of conflicts there, and everyone, I, I can tell you all sorts of stories, and so it's pretty severe behavior, and um, maybe there's a personality component to that behavior. Uh, I would suspect there usually is, but. For the vast majority of people who have, uh, who are on some personality spectrum, uh, they don't engage in that behavior because they're professionals and ethical and they, they try really hard. But I have seen some people with borderline who are trainees uh, have a really hard time dealing with the um, authority of the supervisor. Not that they go against the, the, the authority, but that there's a lot of transference, meaning that the the supervisee um, has a lot of complicated feelings about their supervisor and will be very sensitive to criticism and think about their supervisor a lot. And it takes a special kind of supervisor to pay attention to the borderline trainee uh, so that the relationship doesn't spin out of control and, and bad things can happen, which I've seen before. Um, and when I'm aware of it, I will pay extra attention to not triggering that trainee, to helping them understand their personality so that they can manage their own emotions uh, professionally and also our relationship. So it can get kind of complicated. So what I would recommend that um, you do if you do want to enter the field, which it sounds like you do, and I welcome you into the field, is that you try to be very assertive and upfront with people um, as you enter into a relationship. So with your first clinical supervisor, really try to find someone who you really trust, which can be hard to do. And then once you trust them, lay it on them and just be like, so I just want to let you know, I have this, you don't have to say borderline if you don't want to, but because not everyone understands borderline, you could just say, I'm very, very sensitive to, you know, this and that. And I, I just want to make sure that we have open communication so that um, if I ever am triggered in some way that uh, I'm safe to talk about it with you, because uh, I don't, I'm, I'm, I really want to be a good intern and I want to be, uh, you know, I want to be compliant. And, uh, but I also know from a past experience that if I have an open line of communication, things just go a lot better for me. And so, you know, you, you might have to, and I recommend every intern do that, uh, but uh, particularly maybe for you in your case. All right, let's go into another email. Okay, this next email is from another anonymous patron. He writes, is it possible for a person who has low self-esteem to develop high self-esteem through therapy? 
So just chiming in here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, raising self-esteem is one of the main goals that people seek in therapy. And therapy is a beautiful, wonderful, effective choice when one wants to raise your self-esteem. There are other choices, but therapy can absolutely help with that. You go on to say, if so, what would the person need to do in order to reach that goal of raising one's self-esteem? Just chiming in here again, there's a lot of different forms of therapy. Uh, the three main ones that I employ are cognitive therapy and narrative therapy I, I, and RABT. These, these kinds of therapies are, uh, in my mind, functionally similar when you're actually working with clients. Essentially, what this uh, category of therapy involves is actually changing the way people believe uh, about themselves, cha changing the thoughts that they have about themselves. So, for example, if I had a client who said, um, I'm lazy, I'm a piece of shit, I procrastinate, what's wrong with me? And they're just beating themselves up. And we investigate it. And I say, okay, well, okay, you say you're lazy. Why do you say you're lazy? I'm like, well, you know, I, and you know, they tell me this whole story. And in all likelihood, what I'm going to hear is not a story of laziness, but a story of perseverance, survival, strength, hard work, uh, strength. And so uh, now it just depends on how you look at it. And I'm not going to lie to someone if I, if I really believed that someone was indeed purposely not doing things that they should be doing and, and thus being quote unquote lazy, then, you know, I'm not going to lie to them. But often people who are beating themselves up, it's not justified. And so I will engage in kind of like an argument with the client about like, you know, I'm not, I'm not convinced that you're quote unquote lazy. What I'm hearing is da, 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 da. And they'll be like, well, but you know, da, 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 da. And this, and we start evaluating their internal voices. And we, and a lot of times I'll say, you know, where'd you get that voice from? Who told you that? And they'll be like, well, my dad. I'll be like, okay, well, do you, do you, do you want to accept your dad's view of you and view of, you know, how someone should be? Because it sounds like your dad was not very nice and had some uh, issues about uh, criticism. And, you know, maybe your dad was raised by a very critical father himself. I don't know. So those kinds of, uh, you know, conversations, it's, it's a... Uh, it's not easy. A lot of clients, uh, in my experience, it's not like you just snap your fingers and suddenly they're thinking differently about themselves. Those old voices come creeping back in. And, you know, therapy is a weird process. Um, people often ask me, you know, as a, as a trainer and as a supervisor, as a professor, people ask me, you know, well, how do you do it? And the thing that I have come to in over 20 plus years of training people is that you have to experience it. It'd be like saying to somebody, uh, you know, an alien comes down from out of space and they're like, how do you fall in love? And you'd be like, uh, well, the first thing you do, I mean, how, how old are we talking? Are you, are you 13 and falling in love? Or are you 40 and falling in love? And they're like, well, what does that matter? And you're like, well, when you're 13, you pass a lot of notes and you giggle a lot and you hold hands and but when you're 40, you know, you go on a date and you drink wine and you might have sex. <laughs> and the alien's like, well, I don't get it. And you're like, well, well, okay, let's skip past that part. Well, you know, you look into each other's eyes and you, I don't know, you, you just know. You just know when you fall in love. Two people just know. You know, there's there's electricity or vibe or, you know, chemistry between them. The alien's like, what? Well, it's the same in therapy. How do you know, what, what are you supposed to do to help somebody? You know, as I describe this idea of, uh, you know, challenging someone's belief systems, uh, you know, I could, I could lay it out. I could describe it to you over the span of an hour. But really what it comes down to is I'd have to demonstrate it. I'd have to, and I do this in my classes, I'll, I'll get a student who volunteers and, and I'll just demonstrate the therapy with them. And then we talk about it and then I have them try it out. And then you, you slowly, ever so slowly figure it out. You know, the thing I always tell my trainees is you're not going to feel confident until you're five years into the profession. There's not a lot of professions that are like that. I'm guessing, you know, if you're a banker, you're probably confident after a couple years. 
being a therapist is one of the most uh, self-esteem shredding <laughs> professions you could have. You just feel like you don't know anything, you know, you, you feel like you never will know anything. I remember feeling that way when I was a young therapist and it's just too complicated. So, so anyway, for me to explain it, what cognitive therapy or narrative therapy or REBT was, it's too hard, but essentially what it comes down to is a nuanced, uh, conversation about the belief systems and the core beliefs and the automatic thoughts of the client, the story that the client tells about themselves. And that me as a therapist engages in a relationship with that client that supports a uh, evaluation of the client's narrative. And that's, you know, it has to be embedded in a strong relationship. I can't just tell someone your narrative is fucked up unless our relationship is strong enough and the client actually trusts me and believes me and, and um, I have genuine compassion for them and they're attached to me. You know, there's a lot of things that play in. Uh, another form of therapy that um, I use is interpersonal or dynamic psychodynamic therapy. Uh, again, listen to my deep dives on psychodynamic therapy and interpersonal. It's too complicated to really go into. But in a nutshell, there are two main things that one looks at. One is transference, countertransference, meaning that um, a client and projective identification and also corrective experiences. So a client with low self-esteem will engage in a relationship with me that encourages me to um, put them down or to treat them badly. People with low self-esteem, not everybody, but they often will recreate relationships from their past. So the reason why they, the person has low self-esteem is because they were treated badly when they were growing up. They were criticized or rejected or made to feel incompetent or worthless or deficient or something bad. And so the self-esteem is an outgrowth of that past experience. And, and as they go into therapy and the relationship intensifies, they will inevitably try to recreate these past relationships with me. And then I'll start to they'll, they'll manipulate me unconsciously to start thinking things about them that like, like, oh, this client is boring or this client doesn't know what they're doing or this client isn't moving fast enough in therapy. And then I, you know, I'm trained in well enough to know to pay attention to those thoughts and, and go, oh, wait, those aren't, uh, those aren't helpful thoughts, one. And two, they're probably evidence of the client socializing me to recreate a past relationship and therefore put the client down, therefore um, <clears throat> reinforcing the act of uh, inducing self-esteem in the client. And so I pay attention to that, the counter-transference, and I, and, and I flip that on its head and provide a corrective experience by, uh, by having compassion and actually uh, complimenting the client in a genuine way. It's complicated, but you have, you're trying to provide a corrective experience. I think, I think that's pretty clear. The third uh, main theory that I use is, is Virginia Satir. Uh, she was big on self-esteem. I think she even, I think I have one of her books on my shelf over there that actually is just called self-esteem. Uh, she was uh, one of the main uh, proponents or famous people in the self-esteem movement in the seventies. And in this, uh, and her model is kind of hard to quantify because she was such an experiential therapist. You had, to, you had to see her in action. But essentially what she would do, uh, she would immediately tr uh, try to improve self-esteem in the family and an individual. She thought that that was just a big, important thing to do. And that a lot of, you know, a family would come in with, uh, one of the, you know, the, the oldest son has a heroin addiction or something. And the, Virginia Satir, you know, didn't care about the heroin addiction. All she cared about was, are people in this family, uh, do they have positive regard for each other? And are they bonding well? And does everyone have good self-esteem? And so one of the things that she would do is she would grab the heroin addict and say, you know, and the sister or something. And, and they would say, sister, tell me a, a heroic story about your brother, you know? And the sister's like, what do you mean? Well, you know, tell me a time when your brother uh, saved the day for you or really did, you know, came to your side when you needed someone. And the sister would be like, well, five years ago, you know, he, he stuck up for me at school. 
And Virginia Satir would, great, okay, so I really want you to talk about, you know, I really want you to thank your brother about what happened. So Virginia Satir is not talking about the quote unquote problem. Uh, she's also not uh, buying into the system's idea that the scapegoat is the problem uh, in this family. Um, the idea in family systems is that the the heroin behavior is actually a symptom of the system's problem, which often involves lack of attachment, lack of secure attachment, lack of self-esteem building, lack of bonding. And so she would immediately try to bond people and get people to um, build up each other's self-esteem. So uh, it's not only through that action, but also through um, the expression of emotion within a caring environment. So people can express whatever emotion they have. And Virginia Satir would be very caring and she would engineer everyone around her. You know, so imagine you have low self-esteem and a therapist manages to get all your family members into the office and everyone's praising you and you feel bonded and you're forgiven of the things like that's going to raise your self-esteem, right? Uh, Usually. Okay. So going on with your email here. I have been working on improving my self-esteem with my current therapist. For the past two weeks, she has asked me to read six positive statements about myself daily as homework. When we reviewed the homework in session, I told her that I feel like I am lying and the statements are untrue. She says that I am choosing to believe negative things about myself and I need to choose to believe positive things about myself. I asked her, how do I make myself believe statements that I don't feel are true and don't reflect my experiences? She just reiterated that I needed to choose to believe positive things about myself. I told her that I think that most people with high self-esteem were raised differently than I was and were made to feel like they had value, and I wasn't. They probably don't have to work too hard to believe positive things about themselves, even if they are criticized or rejected by someone. She said that she has clients who had been sexually abused and had high self-esteem because they choose to have high self-esteem. I have asked my therapist to explain this to me, but I haven't been able to understand her explanation. She keeps saying that I, that I can choose what I believe about myself. She does not explain it to me in a way that I can understand. I'm bothered by the notion that this is a conscious choice. How does a person improve self-esteem? How does therapy help with this? End of email. So... I can never tell exactly what's happening. The therapist isn't here to defend herself, but it sounds to me like this is a shitty therapist. (laughs) I mean, again, if we could talk to her, maybe she would have a whole other explanation, but your description, I have to tell you, it just sounds awful. I mean, okay, so what she's doing, and again, I can only go off of your description, which could be distorted. You could be making the whole thing up. I don't know. But from these words that I'm reading on the page here, uh, what she's doing is she's trying to use cognitive therapy. It's a very popular form of therapy, uh, dare I say, particularly among people who don't know what they're doing, because it's very easy to learn. Cognitive therapy is one of the easiest therapies to learn, but it's difficult to master. You know, when I was talking earlier about, um, you know, challenging someone's narrative and and the automatic thoughts and the core beliefs and the schemas that they have about themselves it is a it's within a relationship of compassion understanding bond and also an idea of what tasks it takes to actually um, get uh, the job done when we talk about One of the main factors that play into outcomes in therapy, one of the main um, factors that we've identified scientifically that we can say will lead to better outcomes in therapy is what we call the alliance. The alliance involves three things. One is a a good bond, a strong bond, which it doesn't sound like you have with your therapist. uh, And it doesn't sound like your therapist is paying any attention to that. And the second thing is that you agree on the goals. So it sounds like you both agree on the goal, raising your self-esteem. The third thing, though, is tasks. You have to agree on the task to reach the goal. You and her are, have not agreed on the task. She is saying, I need you to you know, believe or I, and I need you to say these positive things to yourself. And you're saying, I don't want to do that because I don't think it's working. And so she needs to go back to the drawing board and come at it from a different angle and or fully and convincingly describe to you what kind of therapy she's trying with you. 
She has not done that. And so you don't have a bond and you don't have agree in, agreement on tasks. All you have is a, an agreement on the goal. And uh, that might be shaky as well. Uh, so uh, therapists who don't pay attention to the alliance and neglect it are, in my estimate, are, are uh, at the very least not as effective as they're going to be. And at, and at worst, they're unethical because they're ignoring the science. We have found through multiple, multiple studies that it does not matter as much what, ther- what th- type of therapy you use as much as it matters the relationship of, with the client and therapist. I said that very strangely. The relationship that you have with, you know, between client and therapist you know, how good the relationship is, is much more of an indication of how therapy is going to go than the type of therapy that you use. So therapists will often focus. So it sounds like your therapist is really focusing on the cognitive part and complete, which is, which is something a lot of therapists do. They really focus on their theory instead of focusing on the relationship, which it, ha- it has to begin with the relationship. Cognitive, many good cognitive therapists will agree f- about this. Any good cognitive therapist will agree about this. It's like, you need to have a good relationship, and then you can actually start doing cognitive therapy. It doesn't sound like your therapist is paying any attention to that or something has gone wrong or something. What we call what's happening to you is actually a relationship rupture. You've had a massive rupture. Uh, and until that's repaired, it's hard to have anything good happen from therapy. Having said all that, again, I have no idea what's really happening. If she were here, she'd be like, no, you don't get it, da, da, da. So, you know, but uh, returning to what you're saying, so she's hammering on the cognitive part of it. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to rant <laughs> for a second here. There are people that learn very simple ideas maybe their training was bad maybe their brain is bad uh you know i don't know but they uh often it's training honestly and what they will learn is they'll only learn very simplistic uh uh, quote-unquote evidence-based therapies cognitive therapy behavioral therapy these kinds of things and these are wonderful forms of therapy i use all the time but unless you really understand the relationship and the alliance and basically humanistic therapy positive regard empathy all these kinds of things then you're you're not going to be a very good therapist and you're you're going to have a lot of clients who don't like you you know and who aren't going to improve over time um, and so you have these these therapists who who you know they've been they they believe that cognitive therapy or CBT is like the only form of therapy, and uh, and it isn't. It's a wonderful form of therapy, but it's not the only one. And if you try to shove every client into that round hole, uh, every square peg into a round hole, you're gonna you're not gonna be treating your clients well. So. Uh, so uh, you're, it sounds like your therapist is really just trying to hammer the, you know, she's like, I need you to say positive things to yourself. And you're like, uh, I tried that. It didn't really work. Can we try something else? And then she starts to blame you. She blames you. She's like, well, I have other clients who actually are getting better, you know, and you're like, well, I've had a bad childhood. I think that needs to be addressed. And she's like, look, I've had people who have been sexually abused and they do my form of therapy and they have high self. They've had, you know, higher self-esteem. This is, you know, if, if you're describing the conversation right, this is abusive therapy. I mean, I mean, (laughs) there's just so many things wrong with that. One you don't argue with your client about um, this sort of thing. You hear them. You li- you value them. Uh, it you especially someone with low self esteem. <laughs> you don't put someone. It, basically, she's saying you're to blame for your low self esteem. She's not even basically saying that's. She's saying that she's she's blaming you for your low self esteem. And man, it, again. I don't, she's not here. She can't defend herself. But if this is true, this really gets me hot underneath my collar because this is not the first time I have heard this bullshit. You know, if you're not a good therapist and you don't have compassion, then just do something else. You know, there's a lot of other jobs out there. If you don't have an inherent love and care for other human beings, a compassion and a, uh, you know, a bleeding heart, 
then, you know, there are billions of other jobs. Do one of those. Do not become a therapist. It just drives me nuts. And this notion of like, well, therapy is about skills. You know, oh God. I mean, I have interns at these agencies and it's a con- almost a constant refrain that I have to push back against. They're being told at these agencies it's all about skills and, you know, developing skills. And it's like, okay, fine, skills. But think about yourself out there, all you listeners. When you go to therapy, do you want to learn skills? Is that all you want to learn? Is that why you go to therapy? Do you want your therapist to be like, let me teach you a skill? You know, uh, you have low self-esteem. Let me teach you a skill on how to, you know, basically something you could watch a YouTube video about or, you know, something on Wikipedia. What they, all those websites have the skills. It's not, it's, it's not, a, it's not hard to imagine uh, saying positive things to yourself might help with your self-esteem. But, you know, if it was that easy, then there wouldn't be therapy, right? So, you know, what it sounds like you need is one, someone who really pays attention to the relationship. One, two, someone who understands cognitive therapy, uh, you know, she's hammering one particular intervention at you. There's so many other cognitive therapy, schema therapy, narrative therapy angles that they get, that she could be taking with you. It's just, it's incredible that she's just hammering on this, go home, say six nice things about yourself. And, uh, that's all, that's all I have to offer you (laughs) Uh, again, you know, maybe she has more and who knows. Uh, but you know, finding, so finding someone who cares about the relationship, finding someone that you feel comfortable with, finding someone who actually explains things to you, finding someone that knows how to do cognitive therapy, finding someone that knows how to do corrective experiences within dynamic object relations and interpersonal therapy, someone who might bring in your family members, like a satirian therapist and really try to build the bonds. And cause you know, a very helpful cure for low self-esteem is having wonderful relationships. All right, let's take a break, and I'm going to cool down, and let's read another email. All right, we're back from the break. Just some things here. Please become a patron of the podcast. That's the way we know you love this thing. Also, when you become a patron, part of your pledge goes towards various charities that we support, including an upcoming art fund that will be given to uh, someone that has a worthy art project. We've given out lots of scholarships. We've given money to Pet Finder and homeless charities and so on. Also, when you become a patron, you don't have to listen to the ads anymore. So whatever ad you just heard, you don't got to listen to any of those ads. Uh, Okay, so yeah, become a patron. Uh, Let's go on to this next. Oh, this next email, someone sent me a article that is on CNBC website called a psychotherapist shares five phrases parents should never say to their kids and what to use and said. So uh, a a psychotherapist shares the five phrases parents should never say to their kids. All right. Number one, we'll never afford that. We'll never afford that one. Okay. So why would, okay. Reading the article. If something you really want is out of your price range, don't insist that you can never have it simply because money is holding you back. Instead, show your kids that you have control over your finances. You could say, for example, oh, so I guess uh, I see what they're saying, but I don't know. Of all the, you know, the five things that you should never say to your kids will never afford that. I, I just don't imagine that that should be included in that. You know, it's plus it's a pretty, it's a gray zone. Uh, uh, I think what they're saying here is like to kids, you don't want to communicate to them that things are hopeless and that um, the family is destitute and because it it can give the kid this impression that life is hopeless or something. Uh, I think that's what um, also you're, you know, if you say we'll never afford that, you're communicating to kids that uh, a defeatist attitude like, there's no way out of the maze. Um, so we should all just give up. Um, I can see that, I guess, but you know, I could imagine if a parent saying we'll never, you know, like a kid says, I want to, I want to buy a yacht. You know, can we buy a yacht? You know, you could say, look, kid, I'm, I'm never going to afford that. (laughs) You know, plus it's kind of a classist thing 
to recommend. You know, there's plenty of people who can literally never afford that. They can, you know, pretty much predict, look, you know, given daddy's job, we're never going to afford that. Uh, I don't I don't think that's going to damage your kids. Uh, Number two, uh, you make me so mad. Uh, As parents, it's important to stay calm and resist the urge to blame our kids or anyone else, really, for our emotions. Uh, Yeah, Uh, again, it depends. Uh, The the phrase, you make me so mad, isn't terrible, but it's all a matter of what's being communicated. The main thing we, we want to communicate to our kids is that given, depending on their age and depending on the situation, but we want to communicate to our kids that we can handle things because when we're communicating to our kids that we can't handle things, then our kids will be very insecure because they depend on us to be our, to be their foundation. So for example, some people interpret that as like, Oh, you mean I shouldn't cry or I shouldn't have emotion. No, you can have emotion. You should have emotion in front of your kids, but uh, you need to uh, only have the sorts of emotions with around your kids that isn't going to scare them. So let's say that your you know, your parents die or something. And well, that's kind of severe. Let's say, you know, you lose, or you say you're having financial problems and you're really upset, you know, and you're having a, you're having a bad day. And, uh, let's say you go to your friends and you're crying and you're, you know, you're in a fetal position. You're just like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And your friend's like, well, you know, we'll figure this out. Da, da, da. And then, you know, you pull out of the emotional, uh, spiral and you go home and then with your kids say, you know, you, you say, Hey, you know, fin- f- mommy is having some money problems right now. And maybe you cry a little bit, you show emotion, you're frustrated, you're sad, you're worried, but you're not out of control. Uh, that's actually a really good thing to do. So, um, depending on the situation, depending a lot, every kid's different. Some kids are very sensitive to that kind of stuff. Some kids aren't. So, you know, it depends, but um, but this, you know, this phrase that this article is saying, you know, never say you make me so mad. And, you know, what they're trying to get at here is like, you don't want to um, make, you don't want to shame your kids essentially. And you don't want to make your kids feel like crap. <laughs> um, you know, kids, everyone, we make mistakes. We have bad impulses. We do weird things sometimes. And sometimes we're not thinking straight and, and, uh, we need to have grace and forgiveness from our parents uh, because uh, it's just fair and it's optimal for development because uh, you want to keep that bond. When you blame your kids, you know, you're making me mad, you know, look what you did, you know, um, you're ruining my life. Uh, their self esteem plummets and they need to compensate for that somehow by either distancing themselves from you or abusing drugs or something. So, you know, you don't want to, um, do that, but again, it depends on the, depends on the, on the, um, vibe you're giving across. It doesn't really depend on the phrase you're using. Number three, I hate my job. Um, God, I really hate this list. Uh, maybe that's why someone sent this to me. Number three, I hate, so, you know, this is a, a psychotherapist shares five phrases parents should never say to their kids. So a psychotherapist says, never say to your kids, I hate my job. Why? Okay, let's read this. Let's say you had an exhausting day at work and you just want to go home and vent to your partner. It might seem harmless because you weren't even speaking directly to them, but keep in mind that kids do pick up on this messaging. In fact, studies have found that our attitudes about life have a big influence in determining our children's success, especially when it comes to academic achievement. Furthermore, complaining about your job around your kids teaches them that work isn't fun. And as a result, they may grow up believing that adulthood is about spending half of your waking hours in complete misery. Um, Yeah, I guess so. But again, uh, to say you should never say, I hate my job in front of your kids is absurd. (laughs) I mean, uh, you you know, to avoid saying that phrase, will not mean that you have done a good job as a parent. And to say that phrase does not mean that you've done a bad job as a parent. You know, if I had a, if I was to make a list, I would say like, um, never, um, uh, you know, forget about the phrasing, but never, uh, give the impression to your kids that they are unsafe. 
never or try to avoid try to avoid making your kids feel unsafe try to avoid making your kids feel ashamed of themselves try to avoid your kids uh, uh, feeling alone and rejected for who they are uh, you know how about you know these phrases it's just a weird maybe it's a clickbaity thing number four I have to go to the store I have to go to this. Why in the world would you never want to say, I have to go to the store? This is so dumb. I have to go to, am I missing something? I have to go to the store. So you say to your kid, you got your keys and your coat. I have to go to the store. Never say that. Okay, let's read this stupid thing. Whenever you say that you have to do something, whether it's running an errand or going to dinner at grandma's house, you imply that you're being forced to do things you don't want to do. Oh my God, this is so dumb. Again, okay, you know, I get the sentiment here. Like you, you, you don't, I'm guessing that whoever wrote this, that's who wrote this, uh, Amy Morin. I'm guessing Amy Morin had a depressed parent or kind of a Debbie Downer parent. And this is, and she just remembers kind of messages that she got from her mom. And she's just like, never do that. But it's, it's not the phrases. It's the, it's the meaning behind the phrases that is communicated to the kids and the overall vibe that the kids get from the parents. So yeah, if you give the impression that um, you have to do all these things, then yeah, but this is such a, this is just a semantic thing. You know, for, for when, you know, when I say to my wife, I have to go to the store, I'm not implying like, I'm going to be killed or something if I don't go to the store. Like I have to go or I'm forced to go against my will. You know, I'm just going, I have to go to the store. You know, it, the word have to has a lot of different, the, you know, the phrase have to has a lot of different meanings, right? Uh, one is like, you have to, like you have to drink water and you have to go to the bathroom every once in a while. Um, and you have to pay your taxes, right? Um, those are have to, but you know, saying I have to go to the store or, um, I have some work to do, or I, I have to record a podcast. I think people would know those aren't the same meanings. Um, now having said that, I get the sentiment we, and I actually do this with my clients. Sometimes they'll, you know, they'll, they'll say things like this. They'll be like, Oh, I have to do this. And I'll be, you have to, or you want to, because not because I'm picking on their word choice, but because I want them to, I believe it's helpful for some people to actually take control of their lives. And, and so maybe that's what they're getting at here. Anyway, number five, everything will be okay. So this psychotherapist has told CNBC to never tell your kids everything will be okay. Oh boy, let's read this. If your kid didn't get picked as a starting player for the sports team, convincing them that everything will always turn out well won't prepare them for the future. Again, okay, you know, the phrase is not the thing. It's the overall thing, right? You, you don't, yeah, as a parent, you don't want to act like everything's always going to work out because everything doesn't always work out. Uh, so, uh, to, to just act like, oh, everything will be fine. And you know, everything will be okay. Everything will work out is to, uh, set up your kids for expectations that are going to, you know, fail them, but also denies the pain that the kids are going through. You know, it's a reassurance thing. It's actually something they try to train a therapist not to do because there's this impulse that we have when someone is upset is to, is to say everything. It's this, it's an anxiety reaction that you're like, everything's going to be okay. And you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. You know, stop, stop having bad feelings and stop worrying and stop being upset because you know, things will get better. And it's this anxious response. And as a parent, you definitely don't want to do that. But to, uh, to say that you can never say to your kid, everything will be okay. That's ridiculous. There are so many different contexts in which, you know, this is, uh, it's a, I guess it's a very similar uh, rant that I have or reaction I have to uh, advice about to therapists. There's a lot of similar advice to therapists that I'll hear. Uh, therapy, you know, trainees and other people come to me and say, I learned that you should never cross your legs in therapy, or I learned you should never say, how does that make you feel? I learned that you should never, you know, it's like, um, human communication is too complicated for such stupid, obtuse rules. Plus, 
why can't I cross my legs in therapy? You know, well, you know, you don't have an open body stance and, you know, the client will pick up on that. Fuck that shit. Like, if I can't empathize and have compassion with my legs crossed, then I shouldn't be a therapist. It's just so dumb. Anyway, thank you for triggering me, whoever sent this. Um, Let's go on to another email. All right, this next email is from patron Carolyn. She writes, from a clinical, I have a clinical question for you. I am a psychologist. I wonder how you deal with this increasingly common presenting issue. A person comes to therapy who is of regularly good mental health, but currently they are experiencing a lot of stressors at the same time. Many of my colleagues use generalized anxiety disorder uh, with people like this. They apply that label, but this isn't really what generalized anxiety disorder is about, as I'm sure you will agree. What are your thoughts? End of email. Yeah. So if you're not in the business, you won't know this, but uh, there's this there's this disorder called generalized anxiety, and it's really quite specific, and it's not incredibly common. Now, anxiety disorders are really quite common. Something like a third of Americans at some point in their life will suffer from a full-blown anxiety disorder, but that includes panic, OCD, um, other kinds of anxiety disorders. And so uh, generalized anxiety disorder is, you know, it's not incredibly uncommon, but it's not as common as is applied in a lot of uh or some clinical context, I will say. You know, generalized anxiety is is severe. It's not just like, oh, they're kind of anxious about that, or they're kind of worried about things. You know, generalized anxiety disorder is a serious, serious, debilitating, horrible condition that um, is not uh, of the typical anxiety. You know, if, and so the way you're describing this, Caroline, is you're saying, you know, a person of regularly good mental health who is experiencing a lot of stressors at the same time. So the person lost their job or is going through divorce or their kid is using drugs or uh, they got in a car accident, their bills are going up, um, the, the environment is warming, you know, they're, they're worried about things and they're, they're stressed out. Well, uh, if you have a reaction to that, Uh, that is subclinical, that doesn't mean that you uh, qualify for the generalized anxiety disorder. It's rational to worry about your kid who is using drugs. It is rational to worry about the future when you're going through a divorce. If you didn't worry, I would say, what's wrong with you? What kind of disorder do you have that disconnects you from the reality of that? I'm sort of being facetious, but I hope you get my point. And yeah, it drives me nuts. It's a super hacky thing for therapists to do to apply generalized anxiety disorder to everything. I even had a supervisee once tell me, she said, well, you know, they, they don't really qualify for a disorder. So, you know, I'll just, I'll just give them GAD. And that's what, that's what it also bugs, bugs me when people call it GAD. Um, they'll, you know, they'll say instead of generalized anxiety disorder, they call it GAD or GAD. Um, I find that people who use the phrase GAD tend to over-diagnose GAD <laughs> um, because they say it so often that uh, they have to shorten it or something. And, you know, uh, I get it. There's a reason for this. In order for clients to receive care, they often need their insurance to pay for it because private, uh, you know, uh, services are expensive, I am in private practice and have been. I charge $150 a session. And uh, people obviously would want to use their insurance with me because then they would only have to pay like $20 a session or or no dollars a session. And so uh, in order for insurance to pay for it, the clinician has to provide a medically necessary diagnosis that's being treated. PTSD, generalized anxiety, major depression, psychosis, this kind of thing. And... uh, and so we as clinicians are in this kind of strange situation when some clients come in who don't really seem to qualify for any diagnosis in the DSM. Someone comes in, they're suffering, they're upset, they're sad, they're anxious, they're going through a lot of stuff, they, they have low self-esteem, they need therapy, they were abused growing up, and yet they don't actually uh, qualify for any label in the DSM. Because newsflash, the DSM doesn't encompass all of human suffering and all of human conditions. It only encompasses some. So uh, 
So some clients who, where we would morally believe and clinically believe they need therapy. Um, and even, you know, short of that, you know, a lot of people come to therapy who, you know, they just want to explore their life and they don't qualify for anything in the DSM. Uh, there's this sort of expectation that, you know, you're going to uh, somehow engineer it so that insurance will pay for it. And so a lot of clinicians are in this bind of just like, well, I can't really. Um, the, the other bind that they're in is that a lot of clinicians are not trained well enough for diagnosing people. <laughs> um, that's a whole other thing. But anyway, so uh, which would which to you clients out there should be concerning to you and uh, you'd be right to be concerned. It's odd that clinicians, you know, fully licensed clinicians are not competent at diagnosing people. Um, you know, I would, I'll just admit it. I don't think I was particularly good about it and at diagnosing until I was probably 10, 15 years into, into my profession. And it wasn't until I did extra studies and, and it was hard, you know, diagnosing the DSM. Have you seen that thing? It's fucking big and it's weird. There's a lot of case studies, you know, and just reading things. It's, it's not enough. You got to experience it. A supervisor has to walk you through it. Um, it's, it's, it's years and years of experience. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, it's sort of be like, imagine a oncologist, uh, is expected to diagnose all the forms of cancer because they took like a, a 10 week course on how to diagnose cancer. You wouldn't expect that that would be, um, enough education. Well, it's kind of like it is in my profession anyway, because, because we're essentially able as clinicians to diagnose every single thing in the DSM and, and the DSM is large and it, it requires many, many years of study and experience anyway. So there's a lot of people walking around who don't know how to diagnose. They're insecure about it. And they're, they're trying to find a diagnosis to justify so they can put on this client so they can use the insurance so the client can get the help that they need and want. And for whatever reason, this trend that's that's only really been around for the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years in my circle anyway, a lot of clinicians will just will just go for generalized anxiety. And I confront my my interns on this all the time because they'll they'll give a case presentation and be like, okay, this client has generalized anxiety. And I'll be like, okay, tell me the symptoms. Convince me this person has generalized anxiety disorder. They almost never do because it's not a very common disorder. For whatever reason, and these agencies, it's just like, well, you know, the kid went through something hard or the kid's a little anxious, you know, kid's a little uh, stressed out about something, you know, generalized anxiety. And it's just like, no, you know, I think people, they, they see that the title generalized anxiety, it, it sounds sort of like, well, it's sort of general, you know, it's like anxiety in general. No, that means you have anxiety, intense, intense, horrible anxiety that is generalized to a lot of different things. It's not a specific phobia. We have specific phobias, like I'm afraid of heights, or I'm afraid of spiders, or I'm afraid of snakes, or I have OCD, where I obsess, and, you know, I, and I have compulsions. Um, and you have generalized anxiety, we're just worried about a lot of different things. And you're debilitated by it. And, you know, you might become agoraphobic and not leave the house. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I get it. The clinicians are throwing out this generalized anxiety. And the, the thing is, is that um, you, as clinicians, we have to make a stand sometimes. And sometimes it's a, it's a tough call, but sometimes you're, you have to say, I cannot legitimately diagnose this person with anything in the DSM. Uh, and it would be unethical for me to apply a label that, that wasn't justified. And so thus, I have to tell this person, I'm sorry, but um, you can't use your insurance with me. Now, for a lot of people, that means they can't go to therapy. And, you know, I don't know what to do about that other than to push back at our legislatures and say, um, you should, and, 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 you know, we need to completely revamp the healthcare industry anyway, and the, and the insurance agencies and all that stuff. But essentially people who, uh, don't qualify for things in the, in the DSM, there's a subset of people who most people would agree. They still need therapy, even though they don't qualify for any label in the DSM and still would benefit from therapy. And as, and as a society, we would want to give those people therapy and not, and we wouldn't want them to not get therapy because they can't afford it. And so, uh, it, it's, it's important that we change our society. It'll never happen in my lifetime. I, uh, there's no movement along the, I don't, I don't know anyone who's championing this idea. Um, 
And so, you know, clinicians are in this dilemma of just like, well, I guess I got to apply something. Now, I will say that adjustment disorders are pretty broad in their criteria. Some people will argue against that, but um, they are pretty broad. And um, there's a lot of different things in the DSM, including adjustment disorders, that um, are legitimate and can be legitimately applied. So um, anyway, uh, that's about all to say about that. <laughs> Let's go on to another email. Actually, no, that's probably a good place to end. It's now almost 1.30 a.m. in the morning. I should probably go to bed. <laughs> So that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle, in which I yammered after it's it's Psychology in Seattle after midnight. And please take care of yourself and other people because you all deserve it. Mm-hmm.